We're going to call this meeting to order. It's the June 1st, 2023 meeting of the Centerville Town Council. We'll start uh, with the pledge, and if folks could remain standing for uh, a moment of silence. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and Thank you. Before we get started, I think we would be remiss uh, if we didn't formally read into the record our regards for Officer Sam Farrakane, uh, who was laid to rest last weekend in Denton. Uh, Officer Farrakane was sworn in in this very room uh, a month ago by Council Member Johnson uh, and lost his life. Um, probably about a week and a half ago uh, in an off-duty auto accident. And uh, he obviously has our thoughts and prayers with his family uh, and his children as well. We'll start as we usually do with the review of the minutes from past meeting. Uh, the May 18th, 2023 meeting minutes are in your packets. Is there a motion to accept those? So moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Likewise? All right. We are going to have a citizens forum, but it's for folks that are not here to talk about plastic bags uh, or the budget or the budget. So we'll have a, an actual, we'll go into a public hearing for both the FY 2024 budget and plastic bags. Uh, so if, if you have anything to talk about that's not related to single use plastic bags or the budget, please come up and say whatever is on your mind. All right, we'll let the record show everybody's here. Uh, someone just raised their hand. Yeah, by all means. You've got to get in front of the mic, though, Spain. <laughs> um, so I guess I'll just kind of sneak this in. I'm, I'm suggesting that what we do is to ban um, cigarettes um, and beer bottles. This is indirectly in favor of that. I. Um, Recently, I have a little farm outside of town, and you know you get a lot of trash out there. Um, the other day, a, a woman ran through the fence, failed to make that turn, and um, took out some fence posts and some fencing. And, and um, while the police officer was there, she emptied the trash in her car along the side there. And uh, interestingly enough, um, I asked him, are you gonna write her a ticket for that? I said that ticket, I think there's a sign right up the road that indicates that it's like a $500 fine for doing something like that. And, and I said, is it any less a fine after you've had an accident? Or I'm, I think that the penalty for this infraction is greater, um, the, the littering, than the actual ticket that she got for um, taking out my fence. Um, he laughed. And I said, do you write a lot of tickets for people um, littering? He stated that he didn't, and I said, have you ever? He said, <laughs> no. And um, so the one thing that I would propose, I did a little trash picking up today, you know, being a conscientious um, citizen on the way up here, and, and the bulk of what I picked up were cigarette butts. I'm pretty certain that we know that that's kind of obnoxious and smells bad, and you know, I'm sure that somebody thinks that the cigarette butt fairy comes along and picks those up and that they don't wash down into our streams and go into our rivers. Um, and I'd be interested in knowing, and perhaps you guys could glean uh, that information for all of us, as to how many tickets um, our local policemen have written for littering. Not that we have any litter. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else for Citizens Forum not related to plastic bags or the budget? If not, we'll move on. We'll start with uh, Providence Farm Block Party, Donna Di Donato. I don't know that she actually is here, um, but this is a issue that the council has to decide on whether they approve closing the street or not. 
It's not at all a through street. It's the very back end of a cul-de-sac in the Providence Farm neighborhood. It would only be disruptive to the handful of households right there, and I believe all are participating in the planning and attendance of the block party. So to me, this feels like a no-brainer as long as they've met the insurance requirement or whatever it is. Carolyn. And they have? Um, I have not gotten anything from them. Um, I know that they've um, talked with the police department with Chief Hobbs about it, about actually closing the street. And, um, but we can get that from them. And I've been monitoring the um, Facebook group for this and I, pretty sure that they did get the insurance or it's eminent. So I think if we make the approval contingent upon proof of that coverage, that might be a good caveat tonight. Is there a consensus for that? Yeah. Yes. All right. Council Member Beecham. Good. I'm wondering if I should recuse myself or not since I'm a resident of Providence Farm. Well, if that were the case, <laughs> we may not have enough to vote. We don't have a quorum. I'm in favor then. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> we'll do uh, board and commission members' oath of office. We've got Mr. Bew here to be reappointed to the Zoning Board of Appeals, which Council Member Worth is going to handle for us. Do you have this big script for Dan? I don't have the big script. Oh, okay. You okay with that one? Support the Constitution of the United States. I will support the Constitution of the United States. And that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance. And I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to the state of Maryland. To the state of Maryland. And support the Constitution and laws thereof. And support the Constitution and the laws thereof. And that I will, to the best of my skill and judgment. And I will, to the best of my skill and judgment. Diligently and faithfully diligently and faithfully without partiality or prejudice without partiality or prejudice execute the office execute the office of member of the town of Centerville Board of Zoning Appeals uh, member of the town of Centerville Board of Appeals for a three-year term for another three-year term yes expired <laughs> expiring April 26 2026 yeah a April 2026 expiring April 26 yes According to the Constitution and laws of this state. According to the Constitution and laws of the state. The town charter. The town charter. And laws and ordinances of the town of Centerville. And laws and ordinances of the town of Centerville. Okay, thank you. Y'all <laughs> Ever to get applause in yeah. this. <laughs> I beg for it. It says a lot. <laughs> You're doing a heck of a job, Fred, yeah, over there. <laughs> All right, we'll have, uh, I'm glad everybody's here. You can hear how nice of a job Carol D'Agostino is doing as she updates us on uh, Main Street. I saw her come in. <laughs> Can't see me. There's so many people here today. It's <laughs> pretty exciting. Okay, so I have um, three things that I wanted to talk to you about, and I'll make it quick. Um, as you know, the Centerville Spy will become a thing. Um, I've been talking to uh, Dave Whelan. Uh, this is something that I've been um, wanting for a while. Um, there was an attempt to do a, a Queen Anne spy a while back, and it really didn't come to fruition. Um, so I'm very happy that this is happening. What I'm talking to Dave about is uh, having Main Street become a partner with this, because uh, in my mind, this 
aligns perfectly with what Main Street always tries to do, create something or partner with someone to uh, create a vehicle that's going to help our stakeholders promote and get noticed. So what we've been talking about is uh, both, I'm thinking of it as a content provider, um, Dave's thinking about it as a, a founding partner, uh, but essentially what we're trying to um, do is create an MOU that we'll do for a year, try it out. Uh, what it will get our stakeholders is a uh, reduced rates for advertising. Um, and also I'll be able, and I've been submitting things to the SPY for years anyway, but we'll get additional things um, from the SPY so that we'll be able to brand the town as a great place to start a business or uh, come and visit and things like that. Um, the monies for this, because it essentially is a sponsorship, will come out of that bucket of that $25,000 and I'm already getting out from Maryland Main Street. So as we were talking probably at the last time I was here, that was for direct and indirect services. So that's right in our ballpark here. So it's something that we can provide as a benefit because um, what we see with the circular and the other things that we do is I constantly get calls from Kent Island saying, I want to do this. And I'm like, start a business in Centerville and you can. Um, so uh, I want folks who are um, getting the spy and our businesses to know there's a benefit for having a designated Main Street in, in Centerville and for you being here. Um, and so we're kind of trying to tease out what that looks like. And of course, since the SPY is a nonprofit entity, they throw money in this as well. Um, so they're going to help offset those costs too. So once we have something um, more tangible, we met for the second time yesterday. Um, we will go ahead, but um, it's more than 50% 50, 50 reduction in advertising costs. Um, what Every, do, for everyone that's in the Main Street area? Uh, or, or? Uh, businesses and entities within the town limits, and if you also advertise in the circular separately, because okay. the circular is a uh, P.O. box number in, in Centerville or a uh, school or business with a mailing address. Okay. We didn't want to exclude the circular folks, so that's kind of why I'm putting them in as well. So. For folks that don't know, The Spy is a digital newspaper <coughs> with a healthy presence and readership in Easton, Cambridge, and Chestertown. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we, well, I've talked to Dave as well, and we had sort of general consensus that we had put some cash into our FY24 budget for uh, potentially having QAC TV film our planning commission meetings. Mm. Uh, Carol and the town clerk did some outreach with QAC TV they don't seem to have the capacity. It's also the same night as the Board of Education. So we had talked about maybe moving some of those $3,000 into a commitment to help out with the SPY to get better coverage of these meetings so people can hold us accountable and know what we're doing. Right. So um, For it. as the, this moves ahead, I will uh, keep you abreast, but it's perfectly aligned with Main Street, with what Main Street is trying to do. So I'm very happy about that. Um, I wanted to give you some final numbers on the give that from the NASCAR Foundation. So our final uh, money raised was $1,427.08. Um, there's always those weird numbers because some people donate and include the fees mm -hmm. and some don't. So we raised $825 outright. We got one of those randomly selected $750 uh, grants from the foundation, and that was the requirement was that you received at least a $25 donation within that hour. And lo and behold, we had exactly one. Um, so that all worked out. Now, you know, that doesn't sound like a ton of money, but um, if you boost Facebook posts, you know, you'll get something that says, for $14, you can reach 3,000 more people. Um, so the way that this will be um, granted out to the community, so this money is with Chesapeake Charities, because they were our fiduciaries. So I'm meeting with them on the 21st. 
uh, to f kind of hammer out what their requirements are for reimbursements for this type of thing. Uh, but I, I pictured it as being a reimbursement. So if someone has maybe already advertised and wants some reimbursement on what they did, cool. Uh, if they are not doing something right now but may want to do something in the fall because it could be like a PTA or a booster group in, in the school. So we want to get them in the queue and then make a requirement that if they say they're going to do it in September, that within 30 days they've actually spent that money. So uh, we want to benefit as many people as possible. So we're going to hammer that one out. And um, our... Quick, quick question. Yes. So based on what you just said, so in theory, could some of that money be used to boost like Facebook posts about Drink Maryland, Centerville Day, or... Well, no, art? not ours. And that, so it's not our stuff. It's external it, Everybody partners. else's. So schools, uh, nonprofits, businesses... And, you, and this is great because we can make the rules on this. So it, it's a, a little bit larger. So um, we'll be meeting and then figuring out how that all happens. But, you know, $20 at a time, it could help someone who maybe didn't want to take it out of their own pocket but is doing something for one of our organizations. Love so it. a little bucket of money, but it's something. Um, and Drink Maryland, it is June 17th. Uh, coming up, and right now we have nearly 40 um, artisans and um, folks coming, and uh, we're, we're, we have uh, Chesapeake Sons and Philip Dutton and the Alligators as our performers. Um, Chesapeake Sons just got back from Nashville where they were doing some recording, so we'll probably hear some fresh uh, music from them. And um, I, uh, you might recall last year I said that we raised the most amount of money. Well, that was true, and it's true that we've already surpassed that. So uh, year. last year, uh, for our corporate sponsorships, we raised um, $4,850. Um, $4, right now, we're up to 5350 and I got an inquiry from um, Preston Automotive today. So. I don't know where that will go. Um, and it's always interesting to find out how people know. So I said, so how did you find out? He said, well, I have an employee who goes to the event every year and just can't stop raving about it. And it sounds like fun. So <laughs> there's like this fun factor. There's the factor that we're, we're gathering 1,800 people from a variety of places. You know, a dealership could really benefit because we draw from seven different states, you know. so. It's kind of interesting how that works. So that's where we are right now. Our platinum sponsor is Sure United Bank. And not only uh, are they our lead sponsor, but they're also rounding up the troops. So they sent something, uh, a sign up genius out to all their employees to sign up to volunteer. So that is great. Um, June 17th at what time? Noon Karen? to five. Noon to five, Yep. right out of here. Yes. Come get uh, you a drink. <laughs> Lawyers Row and um, and Broadway, and uh, we'll have um, we have our very popular uh, baker, Lucky Heart Bakery, who's going to be right next to Bull and Goat, because not only is she, I just love this woman's soft pretzels. She's going to uh, uh, she's doing limited edition flavored pretzels for both. Um, Drink Maryland and Centerville Day, and she, so she's doing an Old Bay pretzel, but she's also doing a sourdough bread made with the beer from Bull and Goat. So we have a lot of cool, cool things happening. But our other sponsors are Queenstown Bank, um, CR Realty, Rosendale Realty, um, Joseph W. McCartan Insurance, which is new to us this year, uh, Rural Maryland Council, another new. Um, Sponsor Chesapeake Real Estate Associates LLC, Prime Lending, uh, which is also new this year, and the uh, Queen Anne's County Library. Great. So, um, if anything else breaks on this, I'll let you know. But we're heading in the right direction, and thank God because as everything else, everything's more expensive. Mm -hmm. So we really do need the support, and we're very grateful. So that's what I got. Well, thank you very much. Sure. Any questions for Carol? Thanks, Carol. Excellent update.
Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we will move to uh, what I assume y'all are here for. Uh, the public hearing on the budget. No. Uh, <laughs> actually, we're going to do a little bit of a. We'll do that one first because if there is anybody here, we'll we'll uh, maybe let them go home. The subject of this hearing is Ordinance 1-2023 for the purpose of adopting a budget for the Town of Centerville for fiscal year 2024. I will now ask Ms. Karen Luffman, Finance Officer, to provide background on Ordinance 1-2023. Good evening. Hi. Good. Good. Um, so just a quick overview. Um, the FY24 budget will continue the current tax rate of 53 and a half cents, so there's no change. The public utility tax rate will stay 13 per 100 of assessed value, so no change. Um, bottom line transfer to fund balance on the general fund side, we're in the positive $61,968. And on the enterprise fund, transfer to fund balance of 26274 Thank you very much. Any questions for the finance officer? I'll now call upon Carolyn Brinkley, the town clerk, to present evidence of the published notice of this hearing. Certificate of Publication, State of Maryland, County of Queen Anne's, this is to certify that the Annex Legal Advertisement has been published in the Bay Times Record Observer on uh, May 12th, 2023. All right, thank you very much, Carolyn. Uh, we're gonna do this uh, as we typically do with public hearings uh, in three sections. Um, I'm sorry, only two sections. You can't, can't be uh, agnostic on this. We'll first hear from all those in favor of proposed ordinance 1-2023 and then hear from those opposed. Uh, keep all comments to three minutes, please. You're welcome to provide written testimony to the town council as well. Uh, we will now hear from all those in favor of proposed ordinance 1-2023. Uh, let the record show that no one is in favor of ordinance <laughs> 1-2023. <laughs> uh, no one spoke in favor. We will now hear from all those opposing proposed ordinance 1-2023. Reminded years ago when ethanol became something that was very popular. It was just a great thing to do. Um, the only thing is, and we probably still have people that feel that when they're using ethanol that they're doing something wonderful for the environment. The government's own studies showed that it took 1.3 gallons of fossil fuel to produce one gallon of ethanol. Well, that wasn't satisfactory, so the government took a second look at it. They removed the fuel cost to transport it to where it's produced and it knocked it down to 1.2. So to this very day, we're probably thinking that this is a great thing, this ethanol. We're just doing something wonderful. And it just tickles me to death every time I fill my tank and I see that I'm putting ethanol in there. But the sad thing about it too is I have a, a mission in El Salvador. And one of the things that we were concerned about is when they did this, it would drive the costs up of grain and commodities. But you know something, all of us that provide food for people, whether it's here or overseas, we weren't able to generate the 150% increase in the cost of the grains that we used to feed people. And so people starved and they died. But we feel good because we were pumping our tanks full. Now, is this that severe? No, it isn't. But what I want you to, to draw your attention to is that some of this is kind of interesting. Um, I know I'm gonna run out of time quickly, so I'm gonna make one point and make sure I get it in. One of the things that's excluded is a plastic bag that, that contains a newspaper. Well, you know, I could carry a newspaper without a plastic bag, but I, I, it's interesting that that's included. But while we're saying that, if the laws in this state, when you have a landfill, what you do each day is that landfill is covered over. They take dirt and they cover over it. They have this big sheep's foot compactor and it compacts it. And the interesting thing is, is whether it's a styrofoam cup or a plastic bag or a newspaper, you can dig down 80 feet and you'll find that in real good shape. In fact, you can read the newspaper. You know why? Because it's not biodegrading. Now, it seems to me what, what this legislation deals with is people that have no consideration for the environment, just like that lady that dumped her trash out in the side of the road. 
The thing that's interesting about this too is that places that have enacted this, it should, and, and I'm reading from one of the myriad of studies, it should come as no surprise that the humble single-use plastic carryout bag has by far the lowest carbon footprint. The basic reason being that there's simply so little material there. Plus it's plastic, which has a low melting temperature. Now you saw me with a bag in my hand. It was a plastic bag. It was a trash bag, one of the few in our house. I kind of like it. I have a 17-year-old son, and I make him carry the groceries in. And uh, if we were carrying those, he can carry all of them in. He's a young, strapping kid. He can just put his arms through those bags and carry all our groceries in at one time rather than that paper bag. And wait, I'll leave you with this. Speaking of a paper bag, huh? How did they make those again? Wait, they're from trees. From trees. I'm, I'm going to feel real good knowing that we're cutting down some more trees so I can carry my, my uh, groceries in the house. Is there anyone else opposed to the budget? <laughs> <laughs> Is there a, I'm sorry, is there a, no, I will not, yeah, we did oppose. The Centerville Town Council will consider all comments presented this evening before making a final decision regarding proposed ordinance 1-2023. Do I hear a motion to adjourn this hearing? So moved. All in favor, or is there a second? Second. All in favor, aye. 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 I now declare this hearing adjourned. All right, we'll now move to Ordinance 2-2023. The subject of this hearing is Ordinance 2-2023, an ordinance of the Town Council of Centerville to amend the Town Code to create a new Chapter 102 of the Town Code regarding plastic bags to prohibit retail establishment from providing... <laughs> we got you, Mr. Storm, it's okay. Uh, providing plastic carry-out bags to customers and incentivize use of reusable bags. I will now provide background on ordinance 2-2023. Uh, this is a piece of legislation that was introduced by myself and Vice President Kaiser to address uh, what I think is a pressing concern uh, of the fact that we have, we're swimming in a sea of plastic uh, globally and here at home and I think that local government should be a laboratory of democracy. I'm thrilled to see everybody here and all these various opinions. Uh, we've tried our best to exempt uh, if, the, if it doesn't exempt newspaper bags, I think we can certainly uh, make that happen. We've exempted many things here, like uh, the bags you get prescription drugs in, the bags you take home your lunch meat from Food Lion, uh, and any number of seafood, for instance, any number of other bags. So certainly willing to work with folks on uh, how this works. Do you have anything, Vice President? No, you got it. I will now call upon Carolyn Brinkley, town clerk, to present evidence of the published notice of this hearing. Certificate of publication, State of Maryland, County of Queen Anne's. This is to certi certify that the Annex Legal Advertisement Ordinance Number 02-2023 was published in the Bay Times Record Observer on May 12, 2023. We will now, similar to, similarly to 1-2023, uh, we will hear first from all those in favor of proposed Ordinance 2-2023 and then hear from those opposed. Um, because there are a lot of folks here, we're going we're gonna to definitely restrict folks to a hard three-minute cap on comments. So if you could keep it within 10 seconds of three minutes, that would be fantastic. The town clerk uh, will set a timer for every new person once you start talking. We'll now hear from all those in favor of proposed Ordinance 2-2023. In favor. Go ahead up to the microphone if you'd like to share your remarks. I thought, I thought we were going to go based on the sign-in sheets, well, but, we... guess, but that's okay. My name is Patricia Jameson, and I have been uh, a citizen of Centerville. I live in Symphony Village. It's almost 19 years, hard to believe, but I've been there that long. In fact, I was one of the people who went around and collected signatures when we went from three to five council members. So I'm glad to see you all here. We know that there is a plastic pollution crisis at this time. Most plastics are made from oil and gas fossil fuels that contribute to climate change. About 4 to 8% of the world's oil production is for plastics, and most plastics 
are thrown away after a single use. Plastic can take anywhere from 20 to 500 years to decompose, depending on the, the material structure and the environmental features, such as sunlight exposure. By reducing plastic use, the carbon footprint can also be reduced. 100% of baby sea turtles have plastic in their stomachs. Every day, around a million pieces of plastic make their way into the oceans. Also, as the debris in the ocean degrades over the years, it uses oxygen to do so, and low levels of oxygen leads to the death of ocean animals, such as penguins, dolphins, whales, and sharks. <laughs> the biggest irony of all is that it was developed with good intention to protect nature. Scientists thought that they were able to use plastic to preserve scarce natural resources like wood and stone and protect animals from being killed for products like ivory, tusk, and tortoiseshells. As we have seen, <laughs> these positive things have turned to negatives. As plastic began harming our environment by polluting oceans, soil, and the air. Although plastic is entrenched in our daily routines, we can change our routines. And we can reduce the use of plastic every day. It's difficult to change habits, as all of us know. However, we can do that. We've taken plastic for granted for so long. But each of us has the power to make change happen. I am pleased that you, the Town Council of Centerville, has made a commitment to make that change. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Hello. <clears throat> I'm Sarah Shelley. I'm president of Plastic Free Queen Anne's County. And I'm here tonight to give you a testimony from our founder, Ben Takuni, who cannot be with us tonight. So Plastic Free QAC is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to educate and advocate for choices each individual, organization, and business can make to reduce single-use plastic. Plastic Free has collected names of 100 retailers and organizers in a countywide coalition that supports eliminating carry-out plastic bags and replacing them with 10-cent paper bags. This coalition includes businesses in Centerville, for 19 businesses in Centerville, four restaurants, and the Queen Anne County Public Schools. In addition, farms, marinas, hotels, schools, shops, and restaurants in other parts of the county. We also conducted bag surveys of all four grocery stores in our county on two occasions, in 2020 and 2022 including the Centerville Food Lion and the Acme. We counted every shopper uh, leaving each of those stores for an hour, and out of the 1,265 shoppers in December of 2022, only 4.4% exited the store with reusable bags, which was down from 8% in 2020. So for comparison, we surveyed the Aldi store over in Easton where no bags are allowed. And one third of the people there brought their own reusable bags, uh, down from two thirds in 2020. And almost half the people carry groceries loose in their carts without any bags to the cars. And less than 14% use paper bags. So what all this tells us is that people get used to shopping without plastic bags, and also that there's a relatively low percentage of, uh, that rely on paper bags. So we now know that national data shows that only 5% of plastic bags actually get recycled. And um, legislators across the country, um, across Maryland, are beginning to recognize this issue including yourselves. Already eight states and about 500 localities in the U.S. have enacted plastic bag laws. In Maryland, 12 locations have already passed ordinances banning single-use carry-out bags. And Easton's bag um, bill was implemented this past April, 
of this year. And in May, the Sunday Star reported, uh, quote, plastic bag ban circulation of one million plastic bags in a month. <laughs> so it's now time for Queen Anne's County with the Centerville as a leader to take action on the first step to reduce single-use plastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening and thank you for the chance to speak tonight. I'm Mary Friel. I'm the rector of St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Centerville, a vibrant member of the community since 1692. Many members of my congregation have signed the petition uh, in favor of this ordinance. Many of them are also here this night. I've done something very unusual for an Episcopalian. I've come with the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> Many of you have grown up with the Bible that had what Jesus said in red letters. This is the green Bible. Everything in the scriptures that has to do with creation care, with God's care for our world, is printed in green. And I brought this book because it's a foundational text that has been misused for our destruction of the, of the environment. God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. This is the end of Genesis 1. Fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning. For too many years, dominion has been read as domination. Well, how we're meant to understand this passage is to take care of the world the way God would take care of this world. Even those of us who are not Christian and don't come from a Judeo-Christian tradition have a good understanding of the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. What are we doing in Queen Anne's County for our children and grandchildren for the creation that God made? That's what needs to be answered. And I want to close with a quote from a Christian priest and theologian who wrote about the environment, Thomas Berry. We are talking only to ourselves. We are not talking to the rivers. We are not talking to the wind and stars. We have broken the great conversation. By breaking that conversation, we have shattered the universe. I speak in favor of this ordinance as the very least we can do. It's a simple little thing, but it's a very good one. And God will see that it is good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ginger Cushing. I am a member of the Corsica River Conservancy. And we have submitted a letter, our president, uh, on behalf of the Conservancy in support of the ordinance. I also was the site captain for Project Clean Stream, which we held at the Centerville Wharf and got to see firsthand all of the bags that are not making it into the, the uh, recovery stream. So I have a personal stake in this. I am also a town resident. I live in Centerville, and I'm a polymer scientist. My career has been about making plastic packaging and sustainable alternatives. So I do have history here. I believe the spirit of this ordinance is to nudge our behavior not to penalize people, torment people, raise revenues. It's to, to help us do the right thing. And there are a couple of examples in history where we have been able to legislate change effectively. Polystyrene was banned. Now we use paper for cups and serviceware and uh, plates. Microbead plastics were banned. They were used in cosmetics as exfoliants, you know, that you scrub. The, the little sand on you and you get nice fresh skin. You know what else works for that? Sugar or salt crystals. So in thinking about this legislation, I would offer this idea. Let's look at it in terms of need versus convenience. Yes, we need some bags. You, you handle biohazards or food safety or maybe you have physical disabilities. You need a bag, you really do. But then there's convenience, and that's what a lot of these bags are. All the bags we talked about at the grocery store, those are convenience bags. Those are the ones I think we can work on getting rid of. So as, as we go through, let's think about what we really have to have and what we can get rid of. So thank you for your attention. Thank you.
Good evening, council members. I'm Courtney Lee, representing Shore Rivers. We are a nonprofit environmental organization that strives to protect and restore the Eastern Shore waterways through science-based advocacy, restoration, and education. I speak by, on behalf of a robust constituent base that resides here in Queen Anne's County and specifically here within the town limits of Centerville. The waterways that we are focusing on in specific is the Chester River, where all of the um, land use and things that apply to the land will flow into by way of the Corsica River. Shore Rivers is in support of prohibiting retail establishments pro from providing plastic carryout bags to customers. We ask that this ordinance be passed as is without exceptions. It is time for the people of Centerville to bring their own bag. <laughs> Not only for the sake of our, our global changing climate, but for the sake of our rivers. Follow in the footsteps of our neighboring river stewards, the towns of Chestertown in the north and the towns of Easton in our south. Let's take responsibility for one of the top sources of plastic waste that flows into our waterways. The waterways in which we recreate in and eat from. The collective of our local actions to reduce our reliance on single-use plastic production will ignite other counties and then our state legislature to do the same. I bring my own bag and we all can too. Hello, I am Jordan Kafka and I go to the Queen Anne's County High School and I'm a junior, about to be a senior, and me and Megan over there are the co-commissioners co of it. Our, of our environmental club. Um, we did a petition at our school to, to show how many people, are, like, of course, everybody here that's supporting wanting to ban this, the use of the plastic bags. And I agree, the plastic bags, it's a very convenient thing to hold our stuff. And yeah, the paper bags, say you're walking out the rain, they'll break. And that's why we have all these bags mm -hmm. that you can reuse whenever you need them. Because the rest of the plastic bags, yeah, you might, you might use it for like a garbage bag when you get home, but they all end up at the same place. The other day, I, had, I was driving to school with my parents, and there was just a garbage bag on the, on the ground that had exploded, and all the trash got out. And in that trash bag had been more plastic bags. And I just realized that like it's not just like like bad for the environment, it's a beauty thing too. It's just disrupting our nature and it's hard to like see it as like it's in your grass and it's on your farm and it's just, it's just everywhere at this point. And I feel like as a town we could start in taking that step and helping give back to our earth and showing how much we appreciate it for what it gives us. Because in turn, everything that we have in some way came from the nature that's around us. And I would just love to give back and hopefully decrease all the plastic that we have in our water, in our nature, and just everywhere around us and just bring the beauty back. Before Thank you. you. Before you step away, mm -hmm. if you don't mind me asking, how old are you? I am 16. So whether you're for or against what you just said, I sleep better at night knowing that we have young people like you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Hello, I'm Carissa Shu. I'm from Ken Island High School, so rival over here. Um, I'm also 16. I'm a sophomore, about to be a junior. Um, I'm here tonight as a result of my passion for change. I've been involved in environmental advocacy and action for a long time, including helping set up the Upper Shore Youth Environmental Action Summit, which Shore Rivers helped with, um, <laughs> as well as participating in trash cleanups all over Ken Island, because I'm from Stevensville. Um, and I'm a member of the green team at my school. Um, so as a teen who's beginning to see their impending adulthood, I'm always aware of the environment. Every time I see a piece of trash on the ground or the plastic heaps washed up on my community beach, I'm always reminded of the impending threats of climate change. And it's very overwhelming for anybody, but especially the children and teens around who are supposed to be focused on things like grades and playing tag and stuff. Um, but they're here worrying about the future, finding clean water, tropical storms, and all of that. Um, so I believe, like, like they said, plastic bags are arguably one of the most inessential widespread uses of plastic. They're so easy to live without if people just put some effort into changing their habits. Um, but my main thing that I want to argue about tonight is how the younger generation has to deal with inheriting 
all of the pollution and plastic and climate change. Um, so we all know the environment is in danger, but and those who don't say it's not are in denial. And sometimes me as well as some of the other younger folks wish that we could be ignorant too, but we're going to be the ones to live through it a lot longer. Um, including, you know, my younger brothers, I know they're going to have to live through it longer than me and my friends. Um, so I want to give it, you guys all a viewpoint of the younger generation. Uh, simply put, it's scary to sit in biology class and learn what the future might look like, and it's frightening to see the news every time a new hurricane ravages its way through across the world. Um, so seeing discussions and actions like this being taken to begin to make a change make me feel really hopeful um, of the possibility of a good future. And I think that the banning of plastic bags may not seem like much, but changes on the planet-wide level all start in communities like our own. And the Earth's um, climate change issue is no one person's fault, but I think it's everybody's responsibility. Thank you. Good evening, council members. My name is Sarah Price, and I'm here on behalf of the Maryland Retailers Association. We are a statewide membership organization that represents retail businesses of all shapes and sizes from Oakland to Ocean City. Uh, we are in strong support of the ban and fee structure that has been proposed for plastic and paper bags by the Sierra Club and Plastic Free Queen Anne's. Uh, the goal of this legislation, both here and in every jurisdiction, is to reduce the use of all single-use bags. Uh, and the ban and fee structure is statistically the most effective way to do that. Uh, I know that some people, um, uh, they express concerns about the fact that retailers, they just want to keep the fee because they want to make more money. But I'm here to let you know that the average paper grocery bag right now that um, has no branding and no handle on it costs about 12 cents each for the business to bring in for a customer's use. So we are strongly in favor of including the fee and allowing retailers to retain it because um, as we are supportive of reducing these single-use bags, uh, businesses at the same time, they're not given the option to uh, not transition away from plastic. Uh, we've had grocery stores tell us that they would expect their operating costs for bags to uh, increase over six figures per year. In the city of Westminster, which banned plastic with no fee on paper, uh, we had a department store report to us last summer that after that went into effect, their cost for just their average order of carryout bags went from $7,000 for plastic to $30,000 for paper. Uh, so having that 10 cent fee really just helps retailers to just break even on making this transition. Um, and having the fee set in law sets consistent expectations for all customers in all stores in the entire jurisdiction. Anyone who would like to avoid the 10 cent fee or avoid flimsy paper bags is encouraged to simply bring their own bag, which as we all know is the goal of the bill. So we would encourage you to please pass the ordinance as written and thank you for your time. Thank you. Sorry. So I wasn't going to say anything. Um, I came to support my daughter. But um, actually, the other day, I was listening to a podcast. So I'm a midwife. My name is Susan Chu. I um, practice at Anne Arundel um, Medical Center. And the other morning, I was listening to a podcast. Um, and they were discussing how microplastics had been found in human placentas and um, newborn bloodstreams. And I just like realized that it's not just about like the here and now. Like There are humans that haven't even set foot in this planet yet that are already being affected by plastic. And when I went to work that day, as I was delivering babies, I was looking into the faces of these newborns and I couldn't imagine like looking into the face of that person in 25 years and trying to justify our lack of action. Um, I just can't imagine being like, oh, you know, sorry, I needed a plastic bag to carry my groceries. So I think we need to think bigger and I, you know, we hear things about this is just such a small thing, but What's that saying, like a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step or something like that? Like, when, when do we start? We have to start somewhere. We have to start sometime and better now than later. Thank you. 
Good afternoon. I'm Joe Sykes. I live in Symphony Village for the last six years. I have uh, kids and grandkids that I, for a long time, been worried about how I was going to leave this earth to them. And uh, I appreciate having two people here who reminded me that they are caring about what kind of earth we're leaving for them. And so that's been a big deal for me. I now have a great-granddaughter. Uh, she's not talking yet, but I think I need to start doing some stuff before she starts talking to me about it, too. So I think this is, for me, something about, as I'm 77 years old now, that I want to leave a planet that's good for the kids. I worked for Navy and DOD for 52 years, and at the end of my time in DOD, I was actually in charge of climate change policy for DOD. And so climate change is a huge subject. It has a whole lot of moving pieces, and they all interact with each other. And as this gentleman said back here, a lot of times we do things, he gave the ethanol example, that sounds really good when, for the one thing that you did, but it had secondary effects that were probably worse than the one we were trying to improve. And I think we have to worry about that when we do this. But to me, plastic bags that I see all over the sides of the roads everywhere is a simple way we can do something to make our planet better for the kids, and I, and I support it for that reason. But I would watch whatever the secondary effects are. His, his point is good. An electric vehicle is good for the atmosphere unless you're recharging it from a coal-fired power plant. So you need to take it all into account when you do things and adjust it as you go forward if you find out some other things are happening that are not good. So thank you very much for introducing this. I really appreciate it, and I fully support it. Thank you. Anybody else who would like to speak in support of the ordinance? <laughs> right, we have a few people. I can't tell you how immensely grateful I am to hear young people up here talking here, about here. this. Uh, we are so proud of you. It's so way cool. My name is Elaine Studley. I live on Liberty Street, and this is very dear to my heart. I have been on the water all of my life, and so seeing this happen is amazing. Um, and I got to tell you, this wasn't something I expected. My children told me you gave me this gift for Mother's Day. So I, I hope you're delivering. Um, my kid, children never lie. <laughs> uh, we are now losing 100,000 birds a year. In the state of Maryland, DNR says we are losing 500 species. Well, 500 species are in question. That means either endangered or unaccounted for. Mycoplastics now appear in testing throughout the Chesapeake Bay. PFAs in the water are sometimes called the forever chemical because they don't break down a scientific perspective. They're also appearing up and down the food chain, including humans. On average, I found this on the internet last night, and we always know that the internet is 100% accurate, right? <laughs> so what this says is that consumers are actually consuming five grams per week. So basically, we can all get a credit card out of our pocket and eat it. And that is the equivalent of crude. And one of the concerns I have about this is that we're not always making the connection between this and cancer. And I think particularly out here on the shore, that's something we really need to think about. From a humanitarian standpoint or from a religious standpoint, the decline of the Chesapeake Bay is not preordained. Free will plays a role in decision making. Free thinking plays a role in science. Caring about the bay is part of our evolution as a species. And regardless of how you see it as faith or science, they match in this case because the outcome is a matter of free will. I have a story to tell you from my own life that I, I, you know, it really matters to me. That's why this is such a big deal. I'm a Mainer, and I grew up on the water. And when I was a little girl, my father used to walk me uh, on Saturday mornings to the beach, and we would watch the seals play. Um, and it was such an important part of my childhood. Less than a generation later, when I came home from graduate school and visited from graduate school, um, my father was taking the grandchildren, and by that point, all of the things that we had done had been altered completely by changes in the environment. The seals were gone. The mollusks that we, on Friday night, we would go clamming, and we would get clams and mussels, they were gone too. Because of changes in the habitat, it happened there sooner than it happened today here. So I am immensely grateful you're doing this, but the marketer comes out. This is the most best thing since sliced bread. <laughs> okay. So I'm a marketer. Uh, I am a junkie on marketing. These are an absolute wonder for a store. Uh, one of the things that apps, this is 
my company, as you might know. Um, anyway, these are the best marketing tools since sliced bread. Any store that doesn't, wants help with this, I'll give it to them. If somebody wants their design done, just have them call me. I'd be glad to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Peggy Samuels. I'm the deacon at St. Paul's Episcopal Church here in Centerville, and I'm for this ordinance. I live in Chestertown, and years ago, under Mayor Margot Bailey, we passed uh, for reusable bags, and it works. This is a bag from Redner's. It's very easy, you just put it in your trunk, and you bring it into the grocery store. I've been doing it for years. So we need to be good stewards of the environment. Thank you. Hello, my name is Eleanor Streetman and I too live in Symphony Village. I am absolutely in favor of this ordinance and I have one little suggestion. I don't know if everybody's heard about biodegradable plastic bags, but there are such things. You pay for them and I buy them and I use them. So if a merchant says, I need plastic, require them to use biodegradable plastic. It's certified biodegradable. They can use it. Anybody else thinking about it? I'm conditionally in support of it. Um, I signed, I signed a, a petition for Queen Anne's County to remove plastic. Um, I hate, let me start this real quick so I can see where I'm at. I, I hate passing legislation for the sake of passing legislation to look good and to feel good. Um, I'm a truck driver. I'm not super educated. Um, I've worked hard my whole life. I'm from Queen Anne's County originally. My great grandfather used to move houses with horses here in Centerville. Um, in 1985, I went to Peru and we went to the Pajanal region. We built an airstrip uh, for a missionary group. And they told us we were in the upland Amazon jungle. And I looked around and I said, this is like where I come from. They've got parrots. We've got blue herons. They've got uh, capybaras. You know, we've got beavers and, and uh, raccoons. Um, and I appreciated this place a whole lot more when I got back. And I s started over my life to sort of notice the trash along the roadsides. And I believe we need to do something about it. Um, I've heard that these uh, recyclable bags or reusable bags takes about 200 uses to equal one um, or to, to equal the waste generated by using the regular ones. And we've started using recyclable bags. Um, I would like to see evidence. Um, that said, evidence that, that we will have a net improvement. We've got this bay. You and I, if you've lived here a long time, have seen the eagles rebound. There were 500 nesting pairs in the world, and 15 years ago we had 500 nesting pairs on the eastern shore. Um, we'd like to see that. We'd like to see the, the wildlife come back. I'm absolutely for reducing our impact. Um, as a trucker, um, you'll notice, if, if, you, if you've never noticed, next time you drive down the road, look at a newer truck, look inside the smokestack, there's no soot there anymore. In 2004, we started a process of removing the soot. It's $30,000 a truck. Um, and it, it weighed heavily on our ability to do business, but we did it, we absorbed the cost, and I have reactive airway disease, which is mild asthma. Um, I noticeably breathe, breathe easier, and I'm around trucks all day. We absorbed $30,000 a truck. There is some impact to that, though. Years ago, this council um, considered a, uh, an ordinance to, to make it where trucks couldn't go up and down this road. And one of the things that one of the council members said to me was, well, that language worked in another town. Well, that's not evidence. The, 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 uh, the reasoning was it's damaging infrastructure. Um, that's not evidence. That's um, convenience. That's let's, let's move this problem out on the highway or whatever. Um, I'm for this measure. Let's revisit it and see with evidence are we doing something for the environment? Is there something better we could do? Can we use biodegradable plastics that are better than paper or plastic? Is, you know. But anyway, that's where I am. Um, and I hope we make wise decisions here in Sunday. Thank you. Thank you.
right. Anybody else? We'll now move to all those. Up well, just I'm sorry. Very, I'm no, sorry. Just be very quick. I just want to say I'm Sandy Huffer. I live in Centerville, and uh, I totally support this bill. I just wanted to say I'm like amazed at the. Um, what everybody has come up. I mean, I've come to a lot of town council meetings, and um, I'm just very grateful for just the variety of discussion that has happened here tonight and supported this bill, and there's various views. So that's what's so lovely about this. From inner, you know, young, older, in the middle, we can all do something to make this earth better, no matter who you are. And we all need to share in this responsibility. So I'm just very grateful for you bring this forward to uh, for the town of Centerville to move forward and then move on to Queen Anne's County. Thank you very much. Is that really everybody? <laughs> uh, all those opposing Ordinance 2 2023 I'm Ken Huddleston. I'm a resident here for 20 years. I came from the other shore, but I'm a transplant courtesy of the military. One of the things that I am is an environmentalist as well. I'm also a, uh, a person that believes in individual rights and individual freedoms and liberties. And I think if this is important to the community, put it on the ballot. You know, we did have uh, one young lady highlight the fact that there are biodegradable bags. I've used them. But likewise, we also learned in COVID that those uh, wonderful reusable bags, which I have some, are actually hazardous. That's why we went to the single use, even in places like San Francisco, to the single use plastic bag, because one, it was safer. Two, if you recycled it, it actually mitigated the carbon impact from other bags, such as going out and buying trash can li liners for your bathroom trash can. The other thing that I, I would say is, you know, if we're looking at le leaving something to our children, you know, yeah, the environment's a great thing, but one of our biggest problems nationally is a $32 trillion national debt that doesn't even address the unfunded liabilities, which put the actual debt somewhere around a hundred and, what is it, hundred and twenty trillion dollars? So we're probably going to be buried in debt before we're buried in plastic bags. So I would suggest that if this is something the town council wants to pass, put it before the people on a ballot, because right now there are a bunch of folks that are are on one side and only a few that are here because, you know, like me, I work in Northern Virginia still. So it was a pain to drive here and get here in time to come here and say, put it on the ballot. That's all I ask. And I do agree with everyone that said, we have to be good stewards of our environment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just, with my name is Billy Gordon. I'm the owner and operator of Mama Mia Italian Bistro up the street on Water Street. Uh, I am nowhere near educated enough to talk to statistics and facts and things that I don't know anything about, but I'm just here to point out my, my, my simple preferences. I ask that you councilmen and women could maybe make an exception and an exemption for restaurants. And these are for just a few of the following reasons. Uh, again, I didn't go to college. I graduated high school. So these things was like, I had to read it a hundred times to try to understand it. But from what I understand, uh, you, we would essentially be asking the person who answers the phone to take a carryout order to understand and know at that point how many bags are going to be used to bag up this food and then issue the charge at that point. Uh, getting away from carryout for one second, but just to touch on, if you come in with your family, you spend, a, you spend $150 on dinner, you have a great meal, service was great, you, you give a gratuity to the server that's working, these things are all awesome. You pay your check, right before you leave you say, oh, excuse me, one second, can I have a bag because I want to carry this out? From the way that I interpret this bill, me as the establishment owner would then have to ask you for at least 10 cents for that bet, or I would risk being fined or in violation of the bill. Uh, to me, that seems like we're asking restaurants to nickel and dime our customers. Um, and if that 
you know, being able to charge the 10 cents, I understand the concept, I understand the logic. Everything that's been said today has been awesome. And, and, and I'm not here to say that we don't need to fix the problem. I'm just here to say that this could be detrimental to a few businesses in town that are family owned and operated. Uh, you know, Acme's not going to struggle. They can buy bags at a hundredth of a fraction of what I can buy a bag for. But I only buy bags for my restaurant. Uh, uh, quickly, just to touch on it, I just recently found out about this a few days ago, and I can also tell you from my own standpoint, not very many restaurateurs in this town knew that this was going on. Uh, I can speak for Roger that owns the station in Barbecue Bueno. He unfortunately couldn't make it today. He did send an email that I was CC'd on and told me that I was able to mention that he is in support. We're just asking that that there could be an exemption made. I understand that this is great for, for the supermarket and things like that, but here's another issue that, we, that I've found with it, is say you take that bag and you go to the grocery store, you get some ground beef. Unbeknownst to you, that ground beef leaks into the bag. You then take that bag, you bring it to my restaurant to pick up carry out. You put it in that bag. Now there's a risk of cross-contamination. You don't know as a consumer where that came from. Was it me? Was it Acme? Was it something that got in the car? These are just all problems that could pop up for us. Um, not to mention, like I said, uh, and, and I love the fact that there's exemptions made for firehouses and farmers, farmers markets and things like that. I'm just asking for maybe the same simple courtesy to be able to help us get through, um, you know, the cross contamination, you know, the 10 cents per bag, it, it's great, you know, and, and I understand you can buy bags for 10 cents, but you can't put four burgers and four orders of fries and a Tuscan ribeye in a bag that costs 10 cents. That bag already costs upwards of 45, 50 cents. Me personally, we use paper bags. We use them often. I have three different styles of paper bags, but we do use the single use plastic bag for the quick, quick, just one bag, one box, get it out the door. Uh, we would be spending almost triple what, uh, what we already doing. And I just know a lot of people mentioned Easton, a lot of things like that. Easton did recently pass this and they also did make restaurants exempt from this bill. Uh, I'm just simply asking for the same favor. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm John Harper, resident of Centerville Commerce Street. And I'm not going to argue about uh, plastic bag uh, banishment because it's a good thing. What I am arguing against is the way the ordinance is written, in particular the exceptions. So in my um, lifetime, I've lived on the West Coast, and it seems that every municipality that I've lived in has now implemented a plastic bag ban. And uh, the early legislation looks a lot like what is proposed by Centerville. The problems that you get into is once the goodness of banning the plastic is over with, now you have the paper bags. And having lived on a river in Maine downstream from a pulp mill, I know all too well the deleterious effects of uh, the paper bag production. But, um, but the paper bags were allowed to continue in the early legislation because people said, we don't have reusable bags. What are we going to do? Well, we'll substitute paper. And then we're going to incentivize, or rather punish, the consumer by making them pay X number of cents per bag. And we're also going to keep track of it by requiring the retailers to um, provide a paper receipt, et cetera, et cetera. And some municipalities are even deriving income from the sale of paper bags. So uh, that ends up being a uh, huge battle with, with uh, any of the um, plastic bag legislation uh, that is, comes up. But the biggest problem I see with the Centerville legislation is the exceptions. Why are the nonprofits who run fish fries, chicken barbecues, and whatnot, exempt from the regulation. Are they now allowed to continue using plastic bags on infinitum so that this time next year, if we see plastic bags blowing around on the streets, we know exactly who they came from? Um, or are they being exempted because it's too onerous for them to set up a system and cash registers, et cetera, to do the tracking of how many bags they sold and how much. And then we get into the exemptions that uh, are broadly covered by product protection bags. 
And uh, as the legislation for Centerville is written, it says product protection bags being plastic, and these are exempt. And you've got a relatively short list in compared to the uh, other ordinances that I've read. And we look at the use cases in, in, in particular. When I go to Edwards and pick up a pharmacy uh, prescription, this is a paper bag. Do they now have to charge me to take this prescription home? Or so, and so you get into the incentives to make people uh, drop the use of paper bags. And probably what Aldi and Easton has done is the best. Don't provide bags at all. Or charge an amount that is not lost in the uh, total cost of a, uh, you know, a small cart now costs 40 bucks. Am I going to worry about 40 cents worth of bags? No. So I urge you to take this legislation, review it, rewrite it, make sure it's flexible enough to cover the future, make sure it doesn't uh, preclude uh, the use cases where you need a bag such as uh, pr product protection, and bring it back uh, for us to consider again. Thank you. Uh, I just want to uh, want to clarify uh, 102-3 exemptions, subsection D, uh, which has been added since the bill was introduced, states as follows. The charge for paper carryout bags provided for in Subsection 102-2B shall not apply to a paper bag containing prescription medication or prescription product provided by a pharmacy to a customer. I have to applaud that. <laughs> Anybody else? Anybody else opposed to the ordinance? I don't know. This is a lot. Got to come back up. Got to come back up here. We'll let you go again. But do you, you mind? Do you mind if I just said two more points? I apologize. There's oh, a lot no, of four, no. and there's just not a lot of, uh, of of against. And I do apologize. But one of the other things that I noticed was, and, I, and again, like I said, I, I get it. I understand. It. But struggles for restaurants. How would how are we supposed to redesign the entire restaurant to be able to get all of the food that needs to go out to carry out from the kitchen? all the way to the front and then understand is the customer bringing their own bag did the customer bring enough bags uh it, it, there's just a lot of like very small technical things that i could that that, that just seem a little bit hey, you carry out quick service it, at that point it's the line that is going to form of people having to now i have to pass you every single item you have to put every single item in the bag the the build-up that's going to become of this I, I i understand that there's a problem and that we need to face it but i feel like it this is going to affect a lot of people in a lot of ways. And, and I do have to agree with the gentleman that said maybe this is something that should get pushed out a little bit farther and a, a little bit because there's a lot of people that are going to be affected in, in maybe ways. I don't know, maybe somebody realized today that there's an effect that you maybe didn't see. Uh, you know, I, I understand. I support the grocery store. I support the things like that. I just think that this is going to hurt a lot of very small families. Uh, I know that of the five families that I know that own restaurants, three of them had no idea that this was even happening. Uh, I just am curious how much damage is going to be done to it to an industry that already tries to operate on a four percent profit margin. Uh, we've recently had to get rid of styrofoam, which I agreed, I supported. We've switched. We now buy all biodegradable boxes, containers, everything like that. We've 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 gone through COVID with the inflation. This is just something we. I personally can only speak for myself when I say this. I try not to raise my prices. I try to give a fair price for the food. But with everything that's coming, with inflation, with the minimum wage going up, and then now having for us to, to not be able to use these more readily available, cheaper bags for us is going to be detrimental to the businesses that are in this town that are not owned by huge franchises that can dominate the market and buy millions of bags at the time. You know, I can only order a couple cases. Uh, that's just, I just, I appreciate you guys letting me say that again. Thank you. Thanks, Billy. The Centerville Town Council will consider all comments presented this evening before making a final decision regarding proposed ordinance 2-2023. Do I hear a motion to adjourn this hearing? Um, I'd like to make a motion to continue that to allow written comment on the, this matter, mainly because our emails were not working later this afternoon. We might have gotten last minute emails and also 
Um, appears to be some people who've never heard about this. I believe the town clerk did receive emails that came in this afternoon. And on the people not hearing about it issue, we've talked about this at many meetings. Not that I expect everyone to watch all of our meetings as fun and riveting as they are. It's been talked about at many meetings. It's been on the agenda. I don't know what more we can really do. I'd like to make a point more, there's no second on that motion, so. Can you state your motion again, please? I would like to allow written comment um, until our next meeting. Our next meeting is six weeks away. But the ordinance is, um, has an effective date of January 1, so that's six months away. It does. Right. Is there a second? I'll second that and see how we vote. All right. All those in. Uh, I'm in favor of keeping the record open uh, not until you know, the middle of July. Um, but all those in favor of the motion as stated say aye. 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 We should probably do a roll call vote on that. Councilperson Worth? Aye. Vice President Kaiser? No. President Klein is a no. Aye. Mr. Beecham? Aye. All right, motion carries. The record will remain open on this until July. The, well, the middle of July. <laughs> well, I did say our next meeting, so we, if we do have another meeting ahead of that, that would count me. July, well, we'll, okay, uh, July 20th, though, I think for the sake of, although well, that's not the motion that you made. So as of July right now, the motion, uh, the <laughs> record will stay open on this until July the 20th. So by all means, submit written comments. And I will say that without objection, all the comments that we've received so far uh, in email uh, and we, can, we get until the 20th will be entered into the official record. Uh, I don't think we're going to read all these tonight. Um, that's a pretty substantial burden. Most have been restated. Most have been restated. And they run about 50-50, you'd say? Mm -hmm. Okay. There have been some good points brought up this evening that I had not thought of prior. So the extension of this... Um, Give us time to think through some of some of the issues brought up, and I have bags in the back of my car. I drive an electric car. I can easily support this. There were some things that I had thought that I would amend. Um, I mean, if I can just talk about that for a second, the ten cent mandatory charge. I thought that was unfortunate and probably should be deleted in my mind. It should be instead of shall make it a may. But I was surprised to hear that the Maryland Business Association actually wants to see that 10% charge. So I'm rethinking my position on that. Um, I had mentioned at our first reading of this that I wanted to do this in connection with Queen Anne's County so that it wouldn't be, um, wouldn't be perceived as a competitive issue between stores that are within the town and outside of the town. But um, since then I've sort of refocused uh, a slogan that I said at our last meeting of um, think globally and act locally. So locally may just be Centerville. So I, I need to rethink that as well and make a statement and drag the county along with us is probably a, a better way to approach this. You're probably. You're supportive of that. So those are my comments. Thank you for that. Could we ask the representative from Maryland retailers to come up? I just have a couple questions related to comments that we got via email, if you don't mind. I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I'm sure this is what you do for a living, so. If you could restate your name. No problem. My name is Sarah Price here on behalf of Maryland Retailers Association. Thank you. So we received a comment from a local business that one of their key concerns, um, one, they didn't want to charge for the bags because they were worried about anger from customers. Mm -hmm. I think the charge is necessary for a ton of reasons, but their other concern was they don't actually, they say, want people bringing their own bags for shoplifting concerns. And I was just wondering what you've heard from your members, if anything, in municipalities that have passed this already? So we have unfortunately seen an increase in shoplifting in some grocery stores, uh, but I will note that this is happening sort of in conjunction with the transition to many stores also using self-checkout. Um, so it's, it's difficult to sort of pinpoint right. that it's definitely the bags versus people being able to walk up, scan half of the items, and then walk out. Um, and this, it isn't just retail, there is actually an enormous uh, rise in theft uh, that we have seen across the industry, across the state. Um, I 
read, I believe, this week that Maryland is in the top five states with increasing crime at this time. Um, and I, I wouldn't attribute that specifically to bags because that is happening in all, all industries of uh, retail. As far as customer com complaints, we have heard that before. Um, we do actually often hear it from Main Street districts, typically um, I'm really smart. sorry. I have a sorry. lot of trouble when there's background noise. So if we could take conversations into the hallway, that would be super appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. So often we hear concerns like that from small businesses, typically in a Main Street district, who oftentimes are already using paper bags, and um, they say, "Well, why do we? Need, we're, we already have this. We're not making a transition. Our customers don't expect the fee." We don't want to put that on them. Uh, we, all, we hear it a lot from high-end boutiques, um, nice jewelry stores, and um, that actually kind of is why we want the fee set in law, so that it eliminates competition between businesses. We have an even playing field. Every single customer in every single store knows what to expect, and then businesses that would be in competition with one another, say grocery stores, um, don't have to worry about, oh, you know, Food Lion doesn't have a fee, so Acme can't set a fee, or if they do set a fee, they have to keep it low due to that competition. Um, so this way, it is an extremely consistent expectation for everyone. Um, we do also expect the cost of paper to increase over time as more jurisdictions, not just in Maryland, but across the country, transition away from plastic. Um, the state of New York banned plastic with no fee on paper. That went into effect, I believe, in October of 2020. And when that happened, all of a sudden, it was hard to get paper anywhere in the country because there was nothing in that state full of millions and millions of people to encourage them to bring their own bags. Um, so we do think that the cost of paper is, is going to go up. So having that fee already in effect means that businesses don't have to make that decision a couple of years down the line if they see their costs go up. Um, and if it is set in law, then the businesses, if their customers are disgruntled, they can turn around and blame you. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate are, that. Are you aware of any businesses or any ordinances, rather, that distinguish the fee by the size of the bag? We had talked briefly about that last time, about maybe applying the fee to the standard unit measure grocery bag, but not um, you know, the little jewelry bag or whatever. That has not been brought up. We did see exemptions in Baltimore County um, for small independent businesses. They added a definition for small businesses where I believe it was one to three locations exclusively within the county, those businesses would be exempt. Um, and that's something that we also recommended in the city of Frederick when there was a lot of pushback from their downtown area. Um, Something like from the fee, not the, from about the volume of the bag. Uh, right. No, I, the we haven't company. we haven't seen any exemptions okay. for volume. I'm just trying to think of different types of businesses. If there was something like that proposed, I think we would be okay with it. Just given some of the pushback from small businesses, generally we would like to see a consistent fee set. Uh, we do also understand concerns from restaurants, and I. If I may speak to that, I would say typically for the 10 cent fee or for the transition, we see it as an issue of customer choice. You can choose to bring your own bag or pay the 10 cent fee. The way I see it for a restaurant carry out, if you are going through a drive through or you've placed a carry out order, you don't really have a choice to get a bag. Um, so that is a conversation that we've had with some restaurants uh, where, when they have requested exemptions and that that doesn't impact our industry, so we have no issue with an exemption like that. So just. And that's sort of where my head was after the restaurant comment was still ban the bags, but maybe not require restaurants to charge the fee in that there is, there is that lack of a transactional moment for charging for the bag. Right. Hardee's isn't going to just hand you your fries <laughs> with it straight into your hands. Um, Question for you on, uh, are you guys bringing any pressure to bear on producers of reusable bags? I asked that when I lived in the Australian Act back, if you wanted to buy a bag, it was 15 cents. The reusable bags were hardy. I still have some eight years on. Mm -hmm. In Germany, there wasn't an option for plastic, period, no, full stop. Uh, had reusable bags, but the bags were of quality. I've looked at some of the big box stores here. It's good. You can throw a half gallon of cranberry juice in there. It's going to last you once. The handle's going to rip off. Mm -hmm. And my concern is when people start talking about the cost, 
is you're charging them 90 cents, 98 cents for a bag that they're going to get a few uses out of, and that's going to give way. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if any pressure has been brought to bear that, to make reusable bags that are going to hold up a little bit better for the folks that have a, a report for that. That hasn't Just, been brought up as an issue from any of our members. Um, I know the Sierra Club has typically pushed for a definition of reusable bag that includes that the handles have to be stitched onto the bag um, to ensure that it is of a higher quality and it isn't just sort of plastic in disguise. Um, so I know that, that that might be one way to have that be addressed. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. If, if I can take just a couple minutes. Um, just want to say thank you. I know this has already been said, but I don't think we can draw enough attention to the showing that we have tonight. Uh, to come to a 7 p.m. council meeting. It just warms my heart to see this, this level of feedback and uh, involvement with our activities. Um, I just want to draw attention to um, Billy Gordon's comments and appreciate your, your thoughts. You took the time to write as well. We did review your testimony and I think that's important to note for everybody here. When you do take the time to write us, we get a lot. <laughs> and on this one, we got a lot of traffic and we do take the time to read those. So, um, one of the reasons that I voted in favor of the extension of, of a period for comments through July 20th was in part because of your comments when written. So I'm glad you were here tonight to speak those uh, in person. Um, so I share those concerns and I think, you know, the, our, our non-chain restaurants, so our non-McDonald's, non-Hardee's uh, restaurants here in town, I think do have a unique situation um, and so I, I'm glad that we'll have that opportunity and, and I'm thankful Roger took the time to write of course from the station barbecue bueno um, I know I will take the up excuse me the opportunity to reach out to our other restaurants to say please take advantage of this opportunity give us feedback so that we can get this right and if there are certain exemptions that we need to add to an already built list of exemptions then um, just for this council's record, I would be in favor of um, taking a real hard look at that, and I'm glad that we have the additional time to do that. Um, I, I don't want to get on a soapbox, but I do want to just speak to my own personal position on this. I've been asked by a lot of folks that are not for this, why are you really for it? You know, are you an environmentalist, et cetera? And I just, I'm a firm believer that we are not going to fix the world from Centerville. But somebody else gave a really good quote tonight, and I was a sociology minor at Washington College, and I always love, there's a quote from Margaret Mead, the mother of sociology, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. So the county's probably going to do what we're going to do. And if we don't do this, the county's going to eventually do it. And I'm not a big believer in, well, because it's coming, let's just do it anyway. I think there's a lot of merit to this. We've talked a little bit tonight. Um, some of, several of you have given examples of third, fourth order effects that you really have to consider. One of the things that hasn't been mentioned tonight is there is funding out there. There are programs that this town becomes eligible for as we continue to do things that demonstrate our commitment to the environment. So those are some of the things that I'm mindful of as we sit up here and make these tough decisions. Nothing's easy <laughs> and there's merit to both sides of the argument. Um, I took one of my, what I feel like is three trips a, a week to Easton to go to Walmart because I just can't seem to remember everything. But when I do go, the last uh, month that I've been going, I have been literally slow rolling to the, this, uh, <laughs> the disagreement of the people behind me in line, but taking my time to really watch what's going on. And what I've just seen in my personal travels is about 50 to 75% of people that are going to Walmart in Easton are not using paper bags, they are bringing their own bags. And I've not just been looking at that, I'm literally trying to read people's faces. Are they pissed off? Are they, <laughs> are they frustrated? And I can honestly count on no hands how many people I've seen that looked frustrated or upset by it. I'm frustrated because I'm the idiot that walks in and I've got like 20 of these reusable bags in my car and I don't remember to bring them in. <laughs> but it takes me five seconds to be like, hey, you know, one of my kids, go out and get them. So um, at any rate, I just wanted to share those um, sentiments. I'm appreciative of the council's willingness to just keep the comment open a little bit longer here and knowing that we are not looking to implement this until the early part of next year. Um, I feel really good about that. So thank you. And thank you again, especially to our two young people here tonight. You guys are awesome. Thank you. Is it? Yes. Um, you have to come to, the to come to the microphone, and this will be the end. We'll, we'll adjourn after this. We can't. Uh, <laughs> a point that I would like to make <clears throat> is, um, I used to build homes, and they have what's called a builders' association, home builders' association, 
and for a short period of time, I was ahead of it in Talbot County. I quickly left it along with a lot of other builders. I want, I want to point out that when someone from a retailer group says a certain thing, that it sounds like they're representing a lot of retail groups. There's a lot of retailers that don't join it because they're opposed to certain stands that they take. I left the Builders Home Builders Association because they were all for different products that you could use that had formaldehyde and, and things that would kill you, you know, things that, that you're putting in the home because it was cheaper. And a lot of builders left that. But the reality of it is, and, and it's something that I think we all need to consider, the vast majority of all these things go into a landfill. That's where they go. So whether it's, whether it's a plastic bag, whether it's the bag that you have there, and if you look at the carbon footprint on those bags and what it takes to get that in there, there's a, there's a logical argument against those. Um, if someone comes into my ice cream store, and that's a business that I've had for half a century, and if somebody comes into my ice cream store with a bag and says, listen, I want to put my ice cream in there, I'm going to tell them no. Now, they banned plastic bags there. Now, the plastic bags that we had before, you could take your ice cream home and you didn't have to worry about it melting. Now we have paper bags. They're 10 times, nah, they're like 20 times what they were because I have to buy a pretty heavy gauge bag, you know, so that they can get home with the product. But a lot of times the, the person will say, well, can you give me two bags? I don't want that to melt, you know, so you're putting that in there. The fact of the matter is, is that I pass that charge on to the customer. All those increases in costs in the cups, the cups I buy now, they're biodegradable, the straws that I have to hand out three because you start sucking on them in a milkshake and, and they don't work, you know? So you hand out extra ones. There's an additional cost to all of this and that's what the public bears. The public ends up paying that. And so the, the point that I would like to make is that a lot of times when you hear from a group that is a, a retailer's association, they may not come close to representing the number of people that you assume that they do, just like the Builders Association, the number of guys that, that wanted to get away with certain things that the rest of us were opposed to. But the reality of it is, if I had to put an extra 10 cents on each one of those, and I, you know, what do you do? You've got the prices programmed in already on your, on your, um, you know, your point of sale machine, and how do you know what you're going to do? If I were him, if I was in, a, if I was a, a grocery store and someone's coming in there and they're buying meat and it's not protected, it, it, you know, it's, it doesn't have all that on there, I don't want them bringing their bag in. I don't want them calling and trying to sue me later, just like I don't want somebody bringing their own bags in my ice cream store and sticking their ice cream in there. You look at some of those bags out there and they're filthy. You know, people keep using it, keep using it, and God bless them if they want to use them, that's fine. You know, but my recommendation is that they wheel the cart all the way out to their car and put them in the bags there, you know, and, and don't do it inside the store. But the, I do want you guys to consider that, that when certain people come up and they represent certain groups, they don't necessarily represent the majority of those people, and it shouldn't necessarily carry all that weight. Thank, Thank you. you for your time. Thank you. Is there a motion to adjourn this hearing? Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Hearing's adjourned. <clears throat> we'll move into old business now. The first old business is Ordinance 2-2023. The record will stay open on this bill until our next hearing whenever that should occur but certainly not later than if we could take conversations out of the room that'd be great folks we are still in the middle of a town are, council yeah meeting. We're, we're we need folks to take conversations outside thank you thank you the record will remain open on ordinance 2-2023 until our next meeting which will be no later than July the 20th. Is there anything else that needs to be said about Ordinance 2023 tonight? You know, I am certainly amenable as the uh, ordinance's sponsor to a... We'll just wait. I just just wait. Just a few minutes. <laughs> Either I'll wait for the elevator. It's daylight when I get here. I think ironic. <laughs> Thanks for staying, Sandy. <laughs> but to get interest in the wastewater treatment plastic plant. <laughs> uh, I am inclined to to amend this language to uh, reflect 
the restaurant's concerns. I, mean, I, I sort of it makes sense to me the the why it would be a problem there, and I'm I'm amenable to that change, but uh, just not very many more changes, I don't think. But I'm certainly willing to consider that uh, as a friendly amendment, and can work with Sharon on that. I'm in the exact same spot, and I. And no one's here anymore, but not, I don't want this to sound flippant because I don't mean it flippantly at all. But I have a two year old that watches some portion of the movie Wally -E every single day. I see some portion <laughs> of Wally -E every day of my life. And so I have a two year old that is deeply concerned about trash. If he sees trash, he's like, oh no, we need Wally -E because that he sees it every day that there's this like possible future world in which robots are going to be cleaning up our trash and life won't be sustainable on Earth. And I think. Whatever small thing we can do in Centerville, I don't think we're going to be able to drag the county along. I mean, I certainly wish we could drag them along on many things, ta tax differentials, plastic bags, you name it. But I think what we can do for Centerville and what we can control, we have to do. And so I'm not interested either in a ton of amendments to the bill, but I think there are legitimate food safety concerns that can be addressed. I know Chestertown actually just exempted restaurants that's primary purpose was carry out from the ban at all. I don't love that. I think we still need to lower the number of plastic bags in circulation, but I think there's room for this to be cohesive. I think there's room for Centerville Main Street to help businesses that face an impact from bags, do other things, fundraise to get bags. I mean, I think there's things that we can do as a town in the implementation phase of this, and so I remain very strongly in favor of the bill. And I would just echo those sentiments. I am not based on what we know to be true today and the voluminous amount of feedback we've received in writing here tonight up to this point at other council meetings. I'm not in favor at this point of having a ballot initiative for this. I don't think the argument has been made in support of that sufficiently. Um, so as of today's date, um, and barring anything earth shattering that would appear if we are to do as you indicated, Mr. President, um, and make uh, some sort of uh, reflection and allocation uh, noting the restaurant's concerns, then I would be prepared to vote in favor of this uh, on our, at our July 20th meeting. Anybody else on 22-2023? Ordinance 1-2023, the FY 2024 budget. We can pass this tonight if there's a motion or if any other conversation wants to be played out tonight. I'd like to make a motion to approve it if you're entertaining that at this time. Second. Uh, any conversation? Uh, we'll vote on roll call. Councilperson Worth? Um, aye. Vice President Kaiser? Aye. President Klein is an aye. 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 All right. Thank you all. New Business Ordinance 3 2023, penalty reference correction. First reading, sponsored by Vice President Kaiser. I'll turn it over to you. All right, everyone's favorite topic, code enforcement. So um, the first one of these, we have two things, an ordinance and a resolution related to code enforcement. Currently, the town code allows just sort of like a up to $1,000 and fine and a misdemeanor up to six months punishable in jail for almost any code enforcement fraction in town. And it's difficult if you were a resident to just like figure out if you violated it what it would be and it leaves a lot of gray area and i have many many conversations with the town manager about code enforcement and he felt like it was just too subjective for the staff to adequately implement a fine structure for things that we've talked about many times up here up here that might be really egregious illegal signs or you know illegally parked campers as i care a lot about but so the first um the ordinance does a ton of code cleanup, as you can see, to just make everything subject to penalties that are then set forth um, later. And so it just buckets things into categories. I asked um, the town manager to prepare a sort of simple list, and I neglected to print it, but a simple list of what's, oh, he has it in here, thank you. It's in the resolution. Yeah, it's in the, the resolution, resolution, which we'll get to, but they really go together, is a, a list that's super digestible for someone to understand what a class A, B, or C municipal infraction is, and the fee structure starts low and gets higher. You you know build a building without a permit, the fine is obviously gonna be a little higher than you neglect to cut your grass. I think the intention is also to continue to do warnings, right, in a, in a first, not interested in this being a revenue producing thing, but at this point, what we've done is spend a lot of money, I mean, not a lot, but a, some money on a code enforcement officer and received no fines in return for that and, and limited enforcement, which we've talked about 
a lot up here, the need to enforce, and I'll be bringing up a, an issue later about the sort of willy-nilly way that we enforce things in town. Um, and so I would love to see us move forward with this. It makes it, to me, easier to understand if you're a resident. Something I've heard from some of my neighbors is, oh, you know, we moved here to live in the country, and that's great, but you don't. You live in town, and so <laughs> there are things in town that are in the code that make it sort of a functioning town, and, and I think it's important to make that m more readily understood by people so that they know when they're in violation and that it doesn't just take incessant complaints by a resident um, for anything to be done, and also makes it so for town staff, if they did levy a fine, it's not just chip sitting there like, today I feel like fining you $75 and maybe next time 1000 because that's what the code lets me do. And so this just makes it a little bit cleaner. That covers them both. Yep. I figured that out halfway through. <laughs> any, Can't uh, have one without the other. Any, is, it, is it hot in here? Extreme, yeah. Oh, extreme. Yeah. I wanted to make sure I was not ready to <laughs> need to go home and call the ambulance here. Um, <laughs> you would go home? The fire station's like... <laughs> I'm not, you know. I, <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to take this time. Um, uh, any other comments about any of those? Um, I just want to echo that I think the list that was produced in one page or less um, of the different classes and the uh, elements under each was super helpful. So thank you for taking the time to put that together. Anything else? Oh, just because it's worth noting, you know, we want to follow our own rules. Um, we do, as many of you are aware, and it's a, a nice... Uh, treat for our, our kids and our big kids out there, but for First Friday we do a free outdoor arcade. So I want to look at what the requirement is for um, arcades <laughs> and amusements okay. and make sure we're okay. Are we okay? I think you're okay. Um, if but not, look for a fine. It'll be like need a know. permit or anything, then we'll start doing that. But just wanted to note that for the record. Claim sovereign immunity. You'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> no pool holes. We won't do that in the street. <laughs> Okay, we'll now do the allocation request for Lot B, Laser Drive. Mr. Matthews. Good evening, How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you. Um, as I'm sure you <laughs> Folks are all aware their uh, building permit application site plan and all have been submitted for Taco Bell out next to uh, Dunkin' Donuts here. Uh, this is a simple request for the allocations uh, for you to approve or deny the five allocations required for this uh, for this business. Are those that have been previously reserved in association with the business park or new? No, there's only uh, the owners of the business park currently have, I think, 12 or 13 left, which they have the right to reserve for the rest of the business park. And I'm sure that uh, with his sale of lots, he either allows them allocations or not. In the past so far, he has not granted any allocations to others. Um, so, you know, he kind of keeps them reserved for the whatever may come to the rest of the park. And these are paid for and uh, applied for by the company for Taco Bell. We have considered informally, I don't think we ever put it to a vote, a moratorium on allocations in this body. And so I just bring this up only as a matter of consistency, right, that we have sort of agreed as a body to not consider large, well, allocations, granting allocations. We've talked about that here. So I just want to throw that out there. You know, this is a small enough number, I guess, that I'm inclined to say yes. I guess my question is, you know, that's pretty arbitrary. Right? Mm -hmm. This feels like a small enough number, and we can can the plant sustain it? I guess is the question, right? And yes. Yeah. Yes, that's not a problem. Okay. I had the same thought as you in in preparing for this meeting of like we did we talked about a moratorium not all that long ago, and then you know the decision we made then was that 
we don't need a moratorium because we make these on a case by case basis. And so to me, in addition to it being a small number, I'm just more inclined to grant the small number of allocations to a commercial use than a, a government or um, residential use until we expand the plan. And so I'm okay with it. Can, uh, and the only thing I would like to ask is if right now, go ahead and act on this, but afterwards, I would like you to commit that to a number of allocations because uh, with all the work Taco Bell's done to come in, uh, all the money they've paid for their engineering, their site plan, following through with everything, I don't want to see another company come in that may need whatever allocate number of allocations you don't agree to to spend that much money to get this far so that I'm asking this on staff's behalf so that if an application comes in we can stop it right then instead of waiting till this is the last piece of the puzzle for them to start building I mean I get that but Carter Farm spent a whole ton of money to try to come here too and the, the puzzle broke on the on the allocation front and so I, for me, I don't know. I mean, I, I wish he would sell his allocations when he sold lots, personally, but. I get your point, for sure. Right? I think we need to be up forward, uh, up front with people. I think it's whatever that outreach that they're doing when Taco Bell first comes to town or, or let's say, um, everybody likes to talk about Trader Joe's. We'll talk about Trader Joe's. <laughs> you know, when they come to town, <laughs> in some other lifetime that uh, will we'll, we'll, uh, they're coming to you and I think it's is it would it be appropriate to say hey, you know this is we can't guarantee you're gonna get the allocations that'll be a decision that council will make you know is that appropriate that's before it even gets to me that somebody needs to make that because mm -hmm. it'll go to the Planning Commission before it comes yeah, to me. I, I get calls from developers all the time and, and I got one today I got one yesterday and it's we're still not there the council they have to make that call right they're making that judgment call if they want to if they feel optimistic that we're going to go through with the plant it's up to them if they want to go into the planning phases and all these other things at that point in time to me there's a cost of doing business you haven't broken ground if you already own the property well you already decided you were going to do this if you don't own the property and if we tell you you're going to run at risk well, then that's up to you. But what about a smaller user? You know, a, a 2,500 square foot row farms calls you and says they're going to come. Do you have that allocation conversation with them? All? I mean, because we're talking about five for a yeah. Taco Bell. If somebody so, comes that needs three, are you having that conversation? Normally the process is they come in and they want to make application to the planning to, uh, and zoning for uh, concept approval. We don't even start to do allocation talks until the final site plan is just about to be approved. Can we start? I guess is the question. Well, and I, I think if I could, I, so so I want to be really clear that there's no, I don't want to pledge allocations and before we've seen site plans and defang, you know, mm -hmm. defang the planning commission is not the right word, but take sort of, yeah, take the planning commissions. But well, we have the allocations, I so think, we're moving forward. But can I? I was just, and then Chip, I promise I'll defer sure. you to, to follow on. Um, is there any reason, we, we sort of have an academic current state of affairs. The academic state of affairs is we don't have a moratorium in place, but this entire council is mindful of, sensitive to the fact that we're dangerously close to a point where if it's small stuff, we can probably look at saying yes. If it's larger, then we, we need to be nervous about that. So if the very first step is planning commission, that this council can't just say, look, we want to have just a paragraph that's given to anybody that comes to the planning commission that just says here's where we are we're looking at a, a new wastewater treatment facility with possible expansion here's where we are with our funding on a case-by-case -case basis the council is um, making allocations of edus um, but we just want anybody that comes to centerville right now to be aware that this is where we are in that process just as a disclaimer almost that i, I just think could that be at the planning commission I, I, I think what kip might be saying correct me if i'm wrong is that we've got for the sake of discussion, 120 EDUs left to saying, okay, as a council, we're going to set aside 30 more. That's it. 
That's the max okay. we're going to do for commercial. And after that, we're stopping because we're waiting on the plant. But we'll do another 30 at most. Or that's just the number I'm putting out that you guys are saying, okay, we'll allow for this part because we've got business parks and businesses that want to come in. After that, we're on hold. I personally would be in favor if we identified what that threshold is. Yeah. And then I, I I believe in a first in line, first, first allocated kind of thing. However, I, I do believe that we all share a sense of purpose and prioritization around our de designated growth areas. And the business park has been sitting there a long time, so I'm thrilled that something else is going in there that we're able to give you to use to. So um, that certainly has my support. I like that idea. That idea is fine to me, right? I think figuring out what that number is that's based in something other than just it's a round number uh, would be good. And I think also implying that, you know, how much does – so we say we can deal with – I believe you, you know, you can deal with five more ADUs, but – you know, with this YMCA online, those are conceptually to use. They haven't started flushing any toilets out there yet. You know, Board of Education. Uh, their ADUs are already covered. Right, but I mean. The actual flows. The actual flows. Right. So, in a, you know, at some point, you know, one of these is going to be, and in fact, we've probably already broken the cables back, right? I mean, let's face it. I mean, the flows are far more than supposed to be already so, mm -hmm. my, well the the uh, agreement for edu allows us to audit it after a certain number of time measure the flows and charge additional fees accordingly my concern about setting a number is we sort of already have right i mean we've had these conversations that we're at the, that point and to me just because somebody thinks okay they say they have 30 just for sake of conversation they say they have 30 left and i need five and I've spent all this money on site plan and the planning commission's in favor. I've got my allocations. I mean, no, there's still no guarantee until this moment. I mean, so to me, we can set all the things in place. It's still not a guaranteed allocation for that specific user until they come and are granted allocation. So I don't, it doesn't stop that situation, which, you know, I used to be a lobbyist for developers. I get it. They spend a lot of money to get to this point and it would be super unfortunate to get, you know, shut off here, but that doesn't get fixed by us coming up with a fixed number. It's still case by case basis. Well, I think and and even, even over that number 30, we should be able to consider it. I mean, if a very lucrative business that we all wanted to come to Trader Joe's. town <laughs> or an assisted living facility <laughs> or a, a lot hotel, of ADUs, Jim. <laughs> I know, but you know, if we said 30 and here's an assisted living facility wants to come in, it's got 35. Are they turned away at the door, or do we still get to scratch our chin and say, mm, we're going to yeah, change our yeah, policy? Yeah, yeah. Not, That's why I think I don't want to send the wrong message out. Mm -hmm. The threshold's oh. the capacity of the plant, in my mind. Good. Please understand, the reason I'm asking for this is for the town employees. The girls in the office answer the phone. They get this call from whoever. It could be for a single-family home, you know. We brought the one to you for the end of Holton Street. Um, you have this. This is taken five. What are they supposed to tell the people? The process, and that yeah. the process includes a step with the town council approving allocation. I mean, I, there, there's nothing that That's fine. A, a woman, yeah. a woman answering the phone in town hall, can say to someone who calls that guarantees them allocation. Yeah, now, and they so, can come at any time in the process. Our answer may be, mm, we want to see what Planning Commission comes up with, but they could come any time. Well, and I think there's another thing that if you if you want to come to Centerville and build and you haven't done your homework to see what the position is for our wastewater treatment, then if you want to run at risk and you didn't do your due diligence first yeah. before you, yeah. So it's sort of a, well, we thought, well, what made you think that, you know, because you had pretty pictures? Now, but I, I also agree with what Jim is saying. It, what's how how strict would we adhere to that threshold? We're not going to. Uh, if I could ask the council, uh, can we decline EDUs if we let's say we have enough of them? Can we decline them because we don't like what's being developed? Under your so interesting question. It is an interesting question. I mean, right now you've got the ability to approve on a case by case basis, but do you have? Can't be really yeah, yeah, what point is it content regulation? Reasons, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Has anybody actually done it? Said yeah, no, that's a really good question. That. I mean, right now, do you, <laughs> is that even a, I mean, 
you don't have uh, it, it's not a likely question to come up with, with the allocations being what they are right now but I guess you'd really well, let's have say to if have... we didn't like Taco Bell yeah but let's say if we were you know I, an indirect leader well on the, on the face of it if they have to apply for it and we have to vote on it yeah we can say no right whether, it's a, it's for, for whether we pose a, a reasonable defense of that is another matter but the fact that we vote means that we can say no. That's and the right. only time we'd have to defend it is if we sat here right now and said, sorry, Taco Bell, no five for you, but five for Chick-fil-A. I mean, that's the only time that, that you could then get into a some sort of, you know, First Amendment content regulation. We only like the Lord's Chicken and not Taco Bell. I mean, at some point, like, <laughs> you know what I mean? There would have to be this, like, super this or that moment. You, you, you would likely ha have had to have put on the record Right. I mean, some, we're doing this because it's the Lord's like, chicken. Yeah, yeah there'd yeah. have to be. I understand. And, 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 and frankly, like, so, so <laughs> these are issues that come before your planning commission as well. So you're looking at the scenario likely where you're fucking with the planning commission yeah, has said, and mm -hmm. those are, those are issues that, you know, I don't know how often they arise yeah. here, yeah. but you know, I have helpful well, should we should we adjust our we do have a policy to do this. Should we just adjust the policy if we really want to lower the threshold? I think everybody should go back and read the policy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because the policy also says that applications are taken in line in the order and acted on first in that order. First order. Time. Right. So if you don't say anything don't like about that. we're putting a moratorium on, which means we're not going to take any more app, app, and we're not going to take any more applications, and somebody shows up with an application for 40 EDUs tomorrow, the next, whatever, whether it's one house or something you really want in town, you can't act on that until you act on exactly. Yes, but we can person. say no to the 40 and yes to the one in the, in the same breath. Yes, but you still have to. And the other thing is your employees have gone through a lot of legwork to get to that point because you're going to have questions about Okay, how many do we have left? Uh, not that I'm saying we shouldn't know that to give it to you then, but like this Taco Bell, for instance, how many times has it been back uh, in front of the Planning Commission? I've and how much, <laughs> how much time has your volunteers on the Planning Commission spent on it? So well, the town attorney and, and, and money for the Jean. And for yes, sure. so, absolutely. I have two. I think important questions. One, just I may be the only one up here that doesn't know the answer to this, but it would help. So, using the example of the central uh, office for the school system, right now they use a certain amount of capacity where they are physically uh, on Chesterfield Avenue. They're moving into a building in time that already has a certain number of reserved EDUs. When they move and now they're taking up this space, if by some miracle somebody fully subscribed the old Board of Education building, does that new tenant have to apply for new EDUs, or does this there's just a, kind of expand a, in place? As long as the building's still there, it runs with the property, right? As, as long so these as are the, concerns that I as have. As long as, as the building's the, still there, the, the use doesn't change. It doesn't mean that they've moved out, so the use has changed. If somebody moves in and changes the use of it, or if they choose not to pay the minimum bill for that property. Okay. Once they decide they don't want to pay the minimum bill for that property, which has happened on vacant lots, exactly, they relinquish the the uh, allocations for okay. that. That was my first question. The second one is we we talked about this um, as a recurring topic, but how often are we doing those audits where we would be in a position to say, okay, we're dangerously close, and we've just approved another you know minor amount. Um, but we're able to tell the public, hey, as we inch closer to having a new facility, here's where we are in our audit process. Is that? We try to do it every, it's usually in February or March, because okay. that's when we get all of the information for the previous year. As far as the formal one where I sit down and I can hand you a paper, no, I didn't complete that yet. I can tell you the flows went down, because, and the only thing we can equate it to is possibly COVID and everybody was working from home. Everybody says, yeah, well, the schools weren't open. No, the schools weren't open. All the kids that were in these schools are home, but so are the parents. Yeah, and they're not going out side of town, venturing there, using 
public restrooms or anything like that. They stayed at home, they did projects, they used water. Uh, with that being said, the flow had gone back. There was even months that we had gone back to 75% of um, the actual capacity of the plant. When before we were up to 97%, so, you know, it's just, uh, uh, for as long as I've been doing this, you can't put your finger on everything. Literally. Sure. So. And I, I would rather, as I think everybody up here feels, want to see something done right versus fast. So I would imagine sometime in the next three to six months, it would be nice to see yeah, we'll the results we'll of get that audit for you. As, as we get closer to that dangerous moment that I feel like we've already passed. But Well, let's talk about the the number we ought to, you know, how we want to deal with this. But I think tonight, you know, is there a motion to approve this uh, memo? Yeah, I move to approve five allocations for ABTB Mid-Atlantic Taco Bell for a new commercial building located on Lot B, e, Laser Drive. Second. Second. Any discussion? Any further discussion? I think you are. <laughs> what is that? We're all looking at Council you. Member Worth. Uh, yes. Vice President Kaiser. Yes. God. Yes. I'm sorry. Yes. Matt Tom. Uh, <laughs> motion carries unanimously. Thank you. It sounds like the holy chicken. <laughs> sorry, Kip asked if he died. Is he in the, is he really in the casket right now? <laughs> sorry, it's getting like Yeah, it is Thank you, Kip. Oh, I hope not, Kip. <laughs> We're not ready. Is I'm not sitting up here for eternity. Is this yes. <laughs> there is a hell. <laughs> oh. oh. Right. It really seemed like it was coming from you. It was like Bruce. They're trying God. to find it. Said so that Muzak to annoy us. It's like a jerk. <laughs> Let's move forward. Like a. Municipal body. I wonder if that's the lady from the. Do we have any correspondence, town manager? Do you think we have any correspondence? I don't believe we town did. Court. I think it was all related to the plastic bags. Carolyn, do we have any comments? Not comments. Correspondence. No. Okay. Sorry. Maryland Municipal League. Nothing to report. Council of Governments. No report. Economic development. Um, at our last meeting, I just had a footnote that the panel discussion that we did that was on QAC TV, I sent that link to everybody. I think several of you have had a chance to look at that. Um, when I looked at what was on the agenda tonight, I declined to have the, the, the brief slide that I wanted to show kind of the, the big bullet points that came out of the panel. So I will plan on doing that at the uh, July 20th meeting. Uh, it'll be just a brief update, one slide, a couple bullets. That's all I have. Park Advisory Board. No report. Planning Commission has not met since our last meeting. Town Manager. So a few things. We had a Zoom call with Talkie. Uh, they were expressing their frustrations. We had the county involved, a number of people in the effort to, to bring the, the cabling through town and explain to them, we cannot give you permits to properties that we don't own. And there was discussion about, well, if we just go ahead and drill rather than, or, or directionally drill rather than ask, I said, if you're afraid that they're going to say no, I guarantee you start drilling through their property, they're going to say no. So what we have said is we'll help them go up and down Liberty and, and Commerce, and we'll go door to door with them to try and get the approvals that they need, because they've got to go to each property owner to get this done. Um, my sense is they're, they've been contracted by the state to bring broadband across the state. They don't get the option to say, well, we don't want to do that. It's cost prohibitive to go up on the poles. They're supposed to bring broadband to the state, not broadband where it's convenient. But Downtown Centerville is not included in that permit, that contract yeah. with the state. Okay. Well, we've talked to them, and we're going to go door-to-door -door with them to get these approvals. Um, we've done it for other things, so it's, it's, let's just get it done. And, and we, we all got to an agreement. And this is to come down 305, 213? 13. Okay. Yeah. Because they came into 305, I think. Yeah, well, they, they had talked about, well, we can go into the street, and the state's already told them, no, you're not going into the street. And you just can't pop up on property, somebody's property and put a handhold in. So they said, we'll work with you. There's other things we've got to go to door to door on, so it's, it's easy. The 
I'll get to this last. Um, on 6 June, I'm meeting with the chair of the Environmental Transportation Committee, uh, talk about our plant. I've got 15 minutes with them. Uh, on 8 June, we're going to have a meeting on the pond expansion uh, out on the farm um, with DBF to kind of go over some variables that we need to, to go through. Um, you all have been waiting for um, numbers for the new PER, and late this afternoon, just prior to coming over, those numbers came in. We were expecting them on Monday the 5th. They got them. Um, I'll just give you the brief synopsis, and I'll send this to you in email once email gets all straightened out. We looked at four options. One was the uh, a four a four bay sequential batch reactor, which is an expansion of the plant as it is in, in the same uh, vein of, of performance. The next was a three batch sequential batch reactor with the granulated sludge. That is a newer technology, um, very popular in Europe. In fact, to do it, they've got to bring over a seeding uh, of their sludge to get the bio going. The problem with that is, is if, if you get an oil spill or something kills your bio, you, you've got to start all over again, and it's, it's the, one of the more costly ones. Uh, the next was the activated sludge, and then the third was the membrane uh, filtration, which Westminster's doing. Two of the, the numbers on here were for a storage lagoon and for the purchase of a field, and the purchase of the field price they had at $4.75 million, which we know we, we, we've worked around so we don't need that. Uh, so when you look at the, the raw numbers, which include a contingency of 30%, you're looking at between 24 million and 26.5 for the various options. So we're in the ballpark where we wanted to get. Now, we also have a, um, a little inflation factor, it's slightly off, but a 4% over year increase to get to 2026 $20, dollars when we'd be completing construction, which would push it up um, a little bit. And I can't, I haven't broken that number down to say if I take out the, the field, if I take out the, the lagoon, what does that 4% number look like? Because it's different. But from these numbers, what we were looking at early on was about 30 million need. We're still at that. And most impressively, for, that made Kip and I happy was the membrane technologies that are the more advanced technologies that are something that we can build in a modular way so that we don't do the sequential batch reactor and say, okay, pour the concrete and this is where we're at. That's it. So we'll get this for you and as more as the, of the PER comes out, we'll be passing that along. But these early numbers look like we're where we need to be. And Chip, what are, what's the total right now cumulatively of all the federal and other dollars that? With the 15 million from the state, with the 2.1 from the Fed, uh, another 500 from the commerce, and if we fold in the ARPA, because that was for the field, we're, I think, 25, 20.5, I should say. Um, if we can secure the remaining, if we do the pre-authorization and get the 5 million a year, that's going to push us up to around 35. And I apologize, you had said 15 million from the state, 2.1 from the Fed, and the third one was how much was Com it? 500,000 from Commerce, the, the local, uh, what was it, the rural? Rural Maryland. Yeah, rural, rural Maryland okay. grants. Sorry, thank you. Well, so it's from the Feds. Yeah. Not the Federal, the just... Federal Reserve Board. So. Yeah, the Fed. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> uh, anything else? No. You, you mentioned we don't need, you've sort of intellectually moved on that we don't need to buy a farm. With every, so the original was yeah, you got to own the farm. And the administration has changed, not just at the governor's level, but within MDE. So we secured that in writing that you can have, they want to look at the lease and make sure it's as binding as it needs to be. But they have told us rather emphatically, no, you don't have to own the farm. With, in writing? Yes. We have that in writing. I have those emails. From, from a decision maker at MDE? From the division the, chief. The question in my mind is, does that require a, the county to change their there, comprehensive sewer and water plan. Mm. Yeah, there are our administrative changes within the paperwork of the county, uh, and Todd and I have been talking about that okay. to, to bring that forward to say, okay, here's what we need um, in the next iteration of the comprehensive, your, your, your water source, the, the wastewater comprehensive plan. There was, the last time we went through this was uh, previous council, there was a, a farmer that wanted to buy the water adjacent to the current field mm -hmm. 
and there was landowner opposition to that, which proved to be terminal. Uh, the county council did not. So I guess the question in my mind is, are we reasonably confident that, you know, we can get the agreement from the county to do this to the extent that you can be confident at all, right? I mean, I had in my conversations with the county and, and not having to own a farm, I haven't gotten a pushback that's like, you know, we're, we're just not pro-growth. They're not going to go for this. And when, what is the timeline for the redraft of the comprehensive sewer and water plan? The I'll have to get that for you. I don't have okay, that. Because they usually kick into that right after they wrap their comp plan, which they mm -hmm. did. They, they, they should have done. I, I think they do it on Are a quarter. There's a quarterly review that you can go in on. Okay. So, okay. Would it be, be wise for the council to to get on the county agenda at a meeting? Would it be wise for uh, some of us to go in there and talk to them at a, at a meeting formally? I, I, I strongly would recommend that. Yeah, I, I, I like think where your head's at, Mr. President. The, the relationship with the county, I, I think, needs to be um, strengthened. Uh, Todd and I have developed, we're developing a good working relationship, having good conversations, I think, you know, for the county commissioners to work with you all, I think would be important because it's not just going to be, um, the plant, it, you know, and it's the discharge, it's, it's the environmental impacts and things of that nature. There are other things, for instance, you know, the Sandy bottom property where working with them with project open space dollars to acquire that for the town, um, that, that they would, would deed that over. And this is just an option. Um, and they would get the environmental credits, what they're going to need for Southern Kent Island. So there needs to be more of a synergy between the town and the county on how we get these things moving forward. And I've spoken with at least three of the commissioners who have the same sentiment. They would love to have a stronger relationship with this council, so in a very positive uh, manner. Your vision for the state facility out across 301 is that they would, in exchange for connecting to our plan potentially. Okay. That, that um, conversation is ongoing. Conversation is ongoing. They have a need. You know, the county is on record as saying they're on failing, failing septic out there. You've got a truck stop that they talked about putting on to uh, out there on the clearinghouse. And once we talked about the idea of helping us fund our plant and having that resourced with with the sewer allocation that move to the clearinghouse has slowed down. I've also talked to the Commerce Department with the state to say, if you were to put a, a real truck stop out there, that might be an economic engine out there of, of sorts. Um, so we're looking at different ways to help fund this that we also can help out and, and have that synergy between the county, between the state, and say, hey, we're not just asking with our hand out. There's things that we can partner with on this that have a good outcome. A lot of moving pieces. Very helpful update. Anything else? That is all I have for this evening. Town Attorney? I have nothing new this evening. All right, thank you. Finance Officer? The You can just nod to this, and I'll maybe I'll. The fees that we collect from Taco Bell, there's a reserve account established for those, and they're untouchable for anything except. Just call it a lockbox. Lockbox. I like it. <laughs> you said it, not me. Al Gore. <laughs> All right. She keeps it under her desk. Director of Public Works. <laughs> Human Resources Manager. Nothing. Town Clerk. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what happened here? <laughs> In that case. I will not forget the second Citizens Forum tonight. Any citizens wishing to share their thoughts with us, please, by all means. <laughs> Seeing none, we'll move into council roundtable. Mr. Beecham. Nothing here this evening. Mr. Worth. Um, I have nothing tonight. Mr. Johnson. Um, I know we're running long, so I'll be very quick. Uh, Jim Beecham and I have had a couple conversations and agreed that we would like to um, ask Chip and Kip if we could maybe touch base in August so we've got time to to start thinking about this, about some walkable center kind of projects. Um, we've talked about Easton, how the roadway that runs parallel to 50, 50, excuse me, between 50 and Walmart 
They've added sidewalks. They've been able to get some sort of state or federal funding. Um, we have a, a piece of uh, land, of course, that runs from Hillside, several pieces, and the shopping center where we have Food Lion. We're seeing a lot more pedestrian traffic where folks are walking on either side of the road. Um, really dangerous, and so there's a lot of push for, you know, walkable shopping centers. We're seeing, I think, as people are trying to be mindful of the environment and as gas is expensive and uh, funds are limited, a lot more people, I think, are walking to the grocery store. So um, there's an opportunity. We think there's some funding sources out there. So we were hoping with this council's blessing that we could just kind of kick off a discussion, look at what some of the funding sources might be, and then maybe start going after some of that. Mm -hmm. So um, sounds good. And then just I know Ashley's going to say it too, but we have first Friday uh, on Friday, and uh, we have some additional uh, games this time, some really cool stuff for for kids and for big kids, and so we just encourage folks to come out. Vice President Kaiser. So ditto everything um, Councilmember Johnson said about first Friday, and then I know we've run long, but I'm going to bring up an issue anyway. So um, last week, my uh, child wanted to go fishing, and against my better judgment, I took him fishing. And we went to the wharf, and when we were down there Friday afternoon, saw that someone had modified their slip by pulling up two of our boards and replacing them with two longer boards of their own and affixing a dry box to that. That was like, had a bit of a gangster lean to it because it was too heavy for the boards that they put in. So I reached out to the town manager, loves to hear from me on a Friday evening, I'm sure. And um, Kip came to there right away, Kip and his team. And obviously no one gave permission to this slip uh, tenant to do this. And so um, to me, it's egregious enough. Uh, town manager shared with me that they had the slip holder return the pier to its prior state. Don't love that. Don't think we should have randos doing work on our pier. Think we should have licensed insured contractors doing work on our pier and bill the randos for that work. Also, they violated their lease and I am disinterested in further subjective application of the rules and contracts of this town. And so the lease to hold a slip says, the lessee covenants and agrees not to do or suffer anything to be done which may injure, damage, or endanger persons or property in or about or adjacent to the lease boat slip. So they did that. And then further in the lease, it says, lessee's failure to comply with any of the above terms and conditions automatically terminates this agreement. I think we have no choice but to remove this person from their slip. I think the fact that they even thought it was okay to pull up two of our boards and put down two of their own is egregious enough that even if the lease didn't say that, I'd say they gotta go. Town staff disagrees with me. They think they've learned their lesson. What's done is done. I don't think we can be subjective like that anymore. If we have a contract, let's enforce it. What's to stop the next person from doing something even crazier than that? If we don't enforce our lease, we're like the cheapest thing going for a slip with power and water. We provide an excellent community park at the wharf and for someone to think that they get to make that their own in any sort of way is just so insane to me that in my opinion we have no choice but to remove them from their slip but i don't want town staff to have to be the bad guy and so i'd I'll, like I'll be us the bad to be guy. the bad guy i'll be the bad guy i'm, I'm good with it and this is what we have town attorneys for yeah, <laughs> yeah we could, I mean, they're we the could. bad guys <laughs> so his, the lease i read all of the correspondence in the rental slip agreement the lease has not yet been terminated, is that correct? No. No. I would support its termination. We'll, we'll terminate it in the morning. It's okay. easy. Terminate it. And then just from, uh, Tom's turning, so sorry, you know, you're just here a couple yeah, nights yeah. a year. Question for you. Yeah. Having just someone do their own work to return the pier to its prior state, what responsibility those, do we have? I agree with those concerns. I mean, I don't know how complex the, you know. I mean, I could do it probably in practical. actuality. Yeah, but. I think as a policy moving forward, it's probably, I mean, the lease is pretty solid for a short lease that they're responsible for any damage. And I think that would be restoring it to, because it's also, they have the duty to restore it to, you know, to, to the condition it was when they received it. Like, right. like so a is that language, their duty to restore it? Is uh, that sort of give well, there's additional to do it themselves? No, I don't think, I, I don't think it, I mean, I think in practicality, there's additional language in the lease that says if there's damage that we can and will pass the cost of repair on to the lessee. And there's good, you know, I think the concerns about liability for the actual, uh, you know, there are some indemnification provisions. No one wants to have to deal with that. That can be <laughs> to sue their insurance pro or whatever. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, that, that's you, that, that's the town getting sued and then the town having to, uh, you know, counter sue someone else and, and add additional parties and, um, and relying on this language. So you want to cut that off, you know, ahead of the game. If so, I think here you've described something that's probably back to 
to normal in terms of the... Kip's been down to look at it. Yeah. Did bring them boards or okay. okay. I think it would certainly be within the town's rights for something like that in the future to to prevent someone from doing any work on the, you know, and sending them a bill under this agreement and for all of the work. Okay. I'm just gonna go out the saw next time and cut it. So yeah. Oh, I was tempted to do that on Friday, but um, <laughs> it, it, I have photos if anyone wants to see that. I sent them to you. It's pretty egregious yeah, in my opinion. That, right? I share your concern. So we'll terminate the lease. Okay. If you yeah, if you need us to follow up with anything, just let us know. No. Okay. Go, go well, I want to be general. clear. The lease is terminated because of the contract, not because of any action this body. No, has the taken. lease terminates itself. Oh, the right. lease, the lease is being terminated by the language of right. the contract. Okay. It's okay. Just, just discussing how that operates and yeah, you know. Yeah, I just you know, I had several conversations with the town manager about it understood the desire to maybe be a little nice but the contract's a contract in my opinion we don't need to be nice uh first friday is tomorrow first friday. <laughs> just wrapping in a first friday sandwich that's all i have first thursdays are way more fun uh <laughs> council person klein yields back his time is there a motion to adjourn so moved second Aye.